Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's webinar, Spear Safer, Tip to Improve Your Safety When Spearfishing with the guys from Spearfishing Australia. Today, I am super excited to introduce you to the team behind Spearfishing Australia as we welcome back Neil Dorian and introduce you to Bjorn Nielsen. Both Neil and Bjorn have a stack of spearing knowledge and have speared all over Australia and the world. Neil, for those of you who don't know him, is based on the northern beaches of Sydney and has, a, had, a, has had a huge career in both the dive and spear industries in New Zealand and Australia. First starting spearing over 30 years ago, for the last 20 years he has been representing a range of spearfishing brands um, and has for more than 15 years been representing Rob Allen. He is today the brand manager for Spearfishing Australia, who distribute Rob Allen, Savamar, Pelagic, Ocean Hunter and more. Bjorn resides in far north Queensland and on the Great Barrier Reef, obviously, and has been working in the water sports industry since 1999. He has been a Stage C Advanced Levels Instructor for Apnea Australia since 2010 and played an integral role in spearfishing educational since 2009. Bjorn joined Neil and has been working with Spearfishing Australia, representing them in Queen, the Queensland market since 2008 and is an absolute wealth of knowledge on all things spearing and freediving. So a huge welcome back to Neil and Bjorn and thank you so much for being here in the Dive Spear and Sport virtual classroom tonight. Thanks, Carmen. Thank you, Carmen. I'll make a quick start and then I'll pass you over to Bjorn. Bjorn's a free dive instructor, he's got a lot of experience in training free divers and I wanted him to particularly talk about some of the aspects where we're having some issues that Bob pointed out before with, with um, um, spearing fatalities with shallow water blackouts and sambas. Um, so tonight we're going to be talking about a lot of that, but we're also going to be talking about some of the basics of spearfishing safety as well. And I agree with what Bob was talking about before about it being the education of the diver. And that's what tonight is about, giving you some ideas and concepts around how to look after yourself and look after your, your, um, your buddy when you're spearing. Um, so we'll talk about entries and exits. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the equipment, um, floats, flags, free dive watches, that type of thing. Uh, we'll touch on sharks and we'll talk about some of the things day to day that we might experience like currents, uh, boat diving, if you're lucky enough to dive off a boat, um, and weather conditions. So we'll cover all of that and then we'll open it up for questions um, and answers as well um, once we're through that. But I'll pass you over to Bjorn now to, to talk about the specifics of, um, of um, free diving um, from how we would sort of run it on a course, a little bit abbreviated, but um, to touch on, on some of the stuff like shallow water blackout and sambas, which is occurring far too often. I think it's really um, gets to a stage where people are just pushing themselves far too hard um, and pushing themselves obviously beyond the limits of what they, of what they can dive comfortably. And, and unfortunately for some people, they don't get a second chance and, and we end up with, with some of the issues we've been experiencing. But over to you, Bjorn. Thanks, Neil. Um, uh, hi, guys. Bjorn for us. So, um, Carmen kind of asked me to have a bit of a chat around safety and just the responsibility as a diver. Um, and one of the key things she wanted me to ask, talk about was really just why spearing safety is so important. And I guess it's obvious at first, but for myself, for you guys, for your families and your loved ones, we want to keep doing this sport that we love. We want to do it safely. Um, as Bob mentioned, we don't particularly want to be in the public eye. But most importantly, we want to come home at night and enjoy the fish we've just caught. The hardest part now is with the, with the way social media is now, whether you say YouTube or Instagram or Facebook, the amount of content we have available to watch if we're stuck at work or wherever else is watching people, whether it be in Europe or in Australia, dive deep depths in perfect water shooting big fish. It really creates a bit of a competitive market where we want as new divers to achieve these things straight away. And unfortunately, it's become so easy now to go and buy some of the best equipment on the planet, jump on a boat or go from the shore and just go out and have fun, but not realise that as much as the ocean is a fantastic place to spend time, we also have a responsibility to ourselves and our friends to um, make sure we're diving as safely as possible. So um, a few key things that I talk about in courses and more importantly, just when we're training people in spearfishing in North Queensland anyway, is just trying to get people to identify the differences between what they see as competitive freedivers or elite spear fishermen and what we want to enjoy as recreational spear fishermen. Um, and that gets lost in translation sometimes. So for me, there's always kind of 10 cardinal rules that, you, that we work around. 
And the number one of this one, this one I know doesn't work for a lot of people, is quite literally just never, ever to free dive or spearfish alone. Um, the simple fact is that when things go wrong and we're by ourselves, there's no one there to help us. So it's really very important that we have a dive partner we're diving with. Ideally, it's someone you dive with regularly and you can create a great friendship around it. But in places like where you are in Sydney or in North Queensland, there's a wealth of people to dive with. And most importantly, that we're diving in a buddy pair. And so what I mean by that is that if, let's say, Neil and I are diving and we're diving for crayfish in Sydney, I am actively watching him and he's actively watching me on the dives. It's not so much what I see in North Queensland and something we have to train a lot on is that two people jump in the water as a buddy pair, but very quickly they see fish and they just separate off into two different directions. That's just not effective safety and budding and you're not doing yourself or your dive partner any, any benefit there. Not to mention the fact most of the time you're not going to get great fish either. So it's really important that, in the, again, in the case of Neil and I, if Neil's doing a dive down, maybe to snoop on snapper, for example, I'm on the surface actively watching him do his dive. And I'm responsible for him. Obviously, he's responsible for doing the right thing, but ultimately, I'm the one there that's the safety net. As he's coming back up to the surface, I'm still making sure that I watch him the whole time. Once he's on his surface and he does his recovery breaths, which we'll talk about shortly, only then, and, he, and he's told me he's okay, only then does, does the responsibility change hands. And that's now Neil's job to pay attention to me while I do, do my dives. So this is a real key thing and unfortunately for me where I live the Great Barrier Reef is a fantastic place to spearfish very clean water it's warm it's easy and people become complacent um, and as Bob mentioned before some of you got on that's also what's causing some of the issues um, so the idea is to make sure that we're diving in pairs it improves our dive performance because we're feeling comfortable and secure in our own skin and half the time if I miss a fish on the bottom Neil can see it so the number of fish going into the icebox is a lot better too the second key point from my perspective is how hard we push. And um, this is getting highlighted a lot. There's more people in Australia now than ever that are pushing very deep depths in spearfishing. Um, not all that long ago, say 10 to 15 years ago, a deep spearfishing dive was considered to be 15, maybe 20 metres. And you had maybe five or six people going past that. Now we're seeing spearfishermen diving in excess of 40 to 45 metres regularly shooting fish. It's not a bad thing, but it does make life a little bit harder. So in the case of recreational spearfishing, which is what we're talking about now, we should just never be pushing ourselves anywhere near those kind of limits. Um, in freediving courses and more importantly, spearfishing courses, as you become more familiar with the way your body works on breath hold, you get to a point where you start to realize where your body's starting to get its first major urge to breathe. And some people call it contractions. And I know far too many spear fishermen that dive and operate as spearfish on contractions. For me, in recreational spearfishing, this is just really not appropriate. Um, that, that contraction really should be your emergency time. So for me, is that whole dive should be relaxed and enjoyable. Take your time, slow down, and dive safely within those limits. When we get back to the surface and we're starting to do these dives, there's a few other systems that occur um, that make life a little bit harder for us as well. And again, seeing what we're seeing on YouTube and stuff, we're only seeing a very small snippet of the dive. We're not seeing the breathe ups beforehand, the dive profile and the recoveries and, and the surface time. So what I see with a lot of newer divers coming through and even some experienced is they are up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down and giving themselves no real recovery time on the surface to, to recoup. So there is a little bit of a rule of thumb with this one that's quite well known, so I apologise if you're already aware of it. But in the case of the way most of the guys I'm diving with here is regardless of whether we're diving 2 metres or 15 or 20, if, it, if we're running relatively short bottom times, then we're having at least 2 minutes on the surface between dives. And what that 2 minutes is, not up on the surface, quickly breathe, snorkeling, swimming around like crazy for 2 minutes, chasing fish and then diving again because we're still burning oxygen that, that entire time and we're not help, helping to slow our heart, heart rates down again. So for me, it's really important that two minutes on the surface is resting time. It's time for everything to slow down, for us to offload carbon dioxide and onboard oxygen back into a safe level again. That's the standard break even. And that's why so many people are now wearing freediving watches that have those features. 
Neil will touch on those shortly, but things like the Oceanic F-10 or the new Atmos Mission 1, both have those automatically built in. What then happens is people then tend to forget what occurs on the longer dives. And we are seeing some high-end spearfishermen both overseas and in Australia start to really push some long bottom times. So for me, the majority of my dives, regardless of where I am in the country, will be I don't know, under, one, under, under a minute and a half. So no more than 90 seconds from top to top. And I find that to be efficient and more or less that's long enough to find most of the fish I'm hunting. I'm not chasing huge fish in deep water. For those that are chasing more challenging species, they can end up pushing two and a half to even three minutes underwater sometimes. And that's a really long dive and a lot of things happen to your body during that time. So the recovery time has to be significantly longer to bring yourself back to scratch again. So where we go there is rather than a flat two minutes on the surface, we're talking about at least double the dive time. So if we're talking about a two minute dive, we're talking four minutes on the surface. And um, I'm not sure if you tried it, but next time you're doing a dive, sit and wait for four minutes on the surface, it feels like an eternity. But that's the kind of time you are needing on those longer dives to really start to bring yourself back again. Um, so that's the side of things that I find to be really important when it comes to surface intervals. Um, obviously, any questions afterwards, please ask. Um, the, this, this next component from here is really around the breathe up itself. Neil and I are diving, or me and Fabio are diving for that matter, it doesn't really matter a whole lot. And again, what we see is people rushing for their dives, they're excited, they see that fish of a lifetime, or in the case for me, in the, again, in North Queensland, it's my area, um, the first coral trout or the first Spanish mackerel, and all hell breaks loose, the excitement builds, they do a quick flop, duck, duck dive kind of a thing, and are rushing around at the bottom trying to catch fish, but they completely forgot about the breather beforehand. And as a result, they're stressed, often they don't catch the fish, and they're just not being productive. So that lead up and that breathe up of the surface is really important. And it's not around trying to bring oxygen into the system. If we are relaxed on the surface, we are already fully oxygenated. We don't need to be breathing heavy before a dive. What we do need to be doing though is breathing more slowly and helping to relax. And what that's doing is bringing our heart rate down, bringing our stress levels down and relaxing our muscles so we can spend more time underwater. And really the idea behind that comes out of a bit of base of yoga, but that's not really that important, but ideally that breathe in and breathe up period should be looking somewhere around four to five seconds on the inhale and eight to 10 seconds on the exhale. Just doing three to four slow deep breaths, doubling the exhale and the inhale. And that's helping to slow down our heart rates and relax our muscles and puts us in the best possible situation for the dive. On top of that, us being relaxed and slow when we start the dive also means we're a lot sneakier. Um, if you think about, I don't know, the average spearfish in Australia, let's say you're I don't know, six foot tall, you have three feet of fins and four feet of gun at the front. So we're talking about something that's close to four metres long and it's swimming kamikaze at you underwater as, and you're a fish this big, you're going to leave as fast as humanly possible. It's about the scariest thing on the planet. Whereas if that same size thing is moving slowly and very relaxed, you've got a much better chance of getting close to the fish and getting a great shot. So it's not just only about being safe, which obviously is the key around this discussion, but also about being effective and putting fish in the escape to take home. So that slow, relaxed breathing on the surface sets up the entire dive process. And you'll see some of the best spearers in the country will be extremely slow on their inhales, very relaxed, very slow duck dives and very slow movement to use as little energy as possible. And quite often they'll be the same guys putting some of the best, best fish we've seen into the icebox that they'd like to take home. So Give yourself that time. If you've not been involved in any kind of breathing workshops or stuff, have a chat to Fabio um, or Carmen and just have a look into it. It's really, really important. It'll change the way you dive. There's no two ways around that. So we've gone through the process of breathing safe on the surface. We're diving effectively underwater. Hopefully we have a safety on the surface that's keeping an eye on us. And at the end of the dive, we come to the surface. Now, um, obviously, I've, I heard that Adam Stern's coming through next week, so he'll talk in depth about the different types of blackouts. So I won't go into that too heavily. Um, he knows he knows the topic well. Um, but the risk and why it's called shallow water blackout as opposed to deep water blackout for the things that we are interested in, we're not worried about competitive free diving at this stage, is that it does tend to happen in shallow water, so in that last 10 metres from the surface. 
And what's happening is that if we are stressed out and we spend too much time at the bottom, as we're coming back up, the amount of oxygen and pressure we've got in the system is reducing. As we come to the surface, if we aren't then um, recovery breathing correctly, there can be a loss of oxygen to the brain and we'll have a samba, which is a loss of motor control, kind of looks like a bit of a dusty dance on the surface. Or we can have a shallow water blackout in which process hopefully Neil's there to rescue me because otherwise we're in trouble. But importantly is as we come to that surface, the recovery breaths or hook breaths at the end of this dive, and this should be practiced on every dive, whether it be a metre and a half to chase a crayfish. For us in North Queensland, five to six metres of water for a coral trout or even deep water for, um, say, big um, snapper down your way. And the whole process here is as you're coming up, maintaining pressure in the lungs, not this big exhausted exhale before you exit the water, but on the surface, strong inhales, with a quick hold, then a passive exhale, strong inhales, quick hold, passive exhale, strong inhale, hold, passive exhale. And what we're doing now is effectively hyperventilating, which we should never do at the beginning of the dive, but at the end of the dive, it's very effective at bringing that oxygen level back up very quickly and off gas and the CO2 effectively and making sure that we stay safe. While that's happening, I'm on the surface, my mat, I'm out of the water altogether. I certainly don't have a snorkel in my mouth. And I'm looking at my buddy, which in this case is Fabio. Um, and his job at the moment is to keep an eye on me and make sure I'm safe. Once I have done that, I'm comfortable, I signal to Fabio I'm okay, and it's now his turn to dive. Now, a point I didn't touch on, and it's actually my fault for not writing it down like I should have, is when we do that duck dive, um, a lot of people when they first start to spearfish will have a snorkel in their mouth and they, they see this as their airway to the surface to survive. And that's fine when we're on the surface snorkeling, looking for fish or looking for structural caves. But when we go to do the actual dive to go, let's say, chase a, chase a fish or find a crayfish, this snorkel should be being removed out of our mouth before we do the duck dive. It's really, really important. I do see a lot of it in North Queensland too, where the snorkel stays in the mouth. And for me, it's one of the biggest concerns we see. Again, day to day, it's probably not the end of the world, but if you are pushing yourself or you have an accident, this is a direct waterway, the water to enter into your lungs, and that causes a mountain of grief. So please, when you're doing your first part of your dive, ensure you drop that snorkel nice and relax before you start your duck dive. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, so that's that's the process and the safety of the dive side of things. Um, and that's the sort of things we can directly control during the dive. Everything else starts to occur around that and as a responsibility of us as safety divers as well. So we've looked at sufficient recovery time. We've looked at the breathing side of things. But just as important is also being very honest with ourselves about our limitations. Um, and again, I think this is what Bob was alluding to earlier is that we all get very excited seeing people we know or people we're diving with dive that little bit deeper off a reef edge that we've never dived before. And we're seeing people progress extremely quickly without adapting. So being realistic before we go on a dive and realizing that, hey, this is supposed to be fun, not hard, as opposed to some people sort of saying, you've got to go hard or go home. Um, the idea is to relax and enjoy the dive. And that's the really important component is for me. So. Um, Hopefully that makes a, a bit of sense. The second component really is something that Neil's going to help me a little bit with because I don't know the Sydney area all that well. But often some of the challenges we have is around identifying locations, looking at the external environment and how that affects our dive. So we could be looking at currents, rip, swell, obviously rock and reef structure, that sort of thing. And then we have the evidence the ever over kind of powering side of things when it comes to sharks and in my part of the world, crocodiles as well. So it's something you guys don't have to worry about at all, thankfully. Um, they're a whole lot scarier. Um, now, the shark side of things has definitely become more of a challenge over the last, I'd say, 10 to 15 years. And it's a, it's a combination of two things. There's more people in the water now than ever. And of course, we've also got shark protection laws in place now, um, which mean that there are more sharks of size in the ocean. Now, to be fair, it is their home turf. We are playing in it. And they're not this horrible animal that we get shown in the media, but they do deserve our respect. So um, when we are diving and looking at our locations, 
have a bit of a look at your area, make sure you can see in the water if, if it's particularly dirty. Think about how deep you're diving and where you are. But most importantly, just make sure that you're there with your buddy. I'll let Neil talk after this around the specifics of Sydney. Um, a section I want to talk about a little bit now, and it is a bit touchy because of what's happened very recently, is how what happens if people are pushing themselves too far in the group of divers? Because at the end of the day, this entire group is a diver. It's myself and three or four other people, so it's not just about me. Um, in the event of somebody having a um, loss of motor control or shallow water blackout or a samba on the surface, it's really important that person is escorted and helped either back to shore or if you're on a vessel, back to the boat. There should be no more diving for the rest of that day. Please understand, it. it's not necessarily a penalty for, for a mistake, but it's purely for their safety. Um, it may, for some people, they might think that this is a bit overbearing. Um, in the course of teaching people both spearfishing and freediving over the last 10 plus years of been involved in some rescues. Thankfully, none of them overly serious, but enough for me to know mm -hmm. I don't want to see I don't know. have major issues afterwards. So from my perspective, it's really important that in the event of somebody overdoing it, call it headaches, path out, loss of motor control, you can kind of name it whatever you like. Um, they are now designated to be boat driver or surface support on, on, on the shoreline. Um, in the event of something more serious, like a serious blackout, and you'll see them, uh, they'll, they'll lose everything, they'll bubble, like they'll exhale their air on the way up. Those people on a full blackout, I really want them back on the boat, back on shore, and ideally, if there is an oxygen supply somewhere nearby, straight onto O2. Um, again, that is on the severe side, but I would much rather somebody be frustrated with a $75 oxygen bill than not, not with us anymore. Um, please understand I'm not making any judgments on what's just occurred. It's, it's a very, very sad state of affairs. And um, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that happens. But yeah, for me, I just don't want to see people getting themselves in trouble and um, yeah, I guess passing away ultimately. So yes, please, um, if any one of your dive partners has, has had a, um, a summer or blackout, they are out of water for the, for the rest of the day. If there's any serious issues, then they can go see a doctor, but generally speaking, out of the water for the day and they're fine for the next day. Um, hopefully that's okay for all of you. Um, Neil, uh, is it right if I pass over to you to talk about um, rocks and that kind of stuff and the swell and rips that you have in Sydney? No worries, mate. I'll talk about the rocks. Just before we hand over, sorry, Neil, I thought just before we hand over, does anybody just have any quick questions for Bjorn on any of that while it's fresh? Can I just ask, just maybe do something while it's fresh? Yeah, go for it. Okay. I would just sort of, I would put number one third, and I would probably put number three first. So um, the way I look at it is, if you are having a blackout and a samba, it's because you've held your breath too long and tried to go too deep or too far. And having somebody on the surface is a secondary preventative method, method sorry, rather than a primary preventative method. And the primary preventative method is to not hold your breath too long. So I would just reverse the order of importance of those things. So where you started at one, I'd put that three, and where you just went three, I'd put that first. Thanks for the feedback, man. Cheers. Uh, Bjorn, do, do you or Neil have any experience or suggestions or advice or comments on any of these um, uh, freediving Spiro vests that you can buy? You know, the ones with the little CO2 and the buttons and the whiz bangs? I haven't had any first hand experience with the most recent ones. Um, I'm, I'm, think, I'm guessing you're talking about the one that Terry Maas co developed a few years ago. Is that the one? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, I don't it's know who did like it. A, a bit like a, not a horse collar, that's not the right thing, but it's got a CO2 canister and a small computer chip in there that measures change in pressure. So in the event of a blackout and you start to sink, it sets off the canister. Is that the one you're thinking of? Yeah, that's right. And I think it has a feature that if you're on the surface and you haven't pressed the button in 10 seconds, it assumes you've blacked out. So it, 
inflates as well. There's a couple of criteria for it to inflate. Yeah, yeah, that's the one that Terry Mars um, developed. I, I, I haven't been involved in the one that's got the, the button on the surface. I had a fair while back, I think there was one in Cairns that we were dabbling with, which was an early production or pre-production version. Um, and I mean, I have my personal belief on that. It will definitely do the job it's designed to do. Um, my biggest concern with it is offering a false sense of security for people um, to say, well, hey, I've got this vest. I'm going to push that a little bit harder to chase that job fish or that dog tooth tuna and then rely on the vest to get me out of trouble. Uh, that's pretty my biggest concern, but I haven't had any first-hand experience using one, though. Gotcha. Thanks. Awesome. All right. Let's, um... No? Beautiful. Let's, let's uh, keep going with Neil and we'll, um, yeah, come back to it at the, the end of the session. Thanks so much, Bjorn. Neil? Very good. Yeah, thanks, Bjorn. That's very informative. Um, and certainly um, having dived with Bjorn a, a fair bit, um, I do find he's one of those people that does practice what he preaches as well. I'm prone to sometimes going off and diving by myself and not necessarily following the rules. But whenever I've dived with Bjorn, um, he's right there. And I remember one instance where we were um, down in the Morning Peninsula and it was quite just a shallow dive. And I was pulling out one of those um, those southern rock lobsters down there, which could be a little bit of a menace to try to pull out of a hole and took a fair bit to get it out. And um, I got to the surface um, and there was Bjorn right beside me, um, just making sure that I was I was safe and 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 okay to carry on. So it, it's very great. It's great when you actually have that sort of situation where you're diving as a team and somebody's there to support you. And I've certainly experienced that firsthand with them. So as far as some of the things to be aware of in Sydney, um, first of all, if you're going out, um, look, the weather, look at the forecast before, particularly if you're, you're further out west and not right on the ocean, is to, is to look at the weather forecast and have some idea of what you're getting yourself into before you get down there. Bomb, boy weather, all those type of sites. But you've also got those live campsites as well that give you a very good insight into your surf conditions. Um, so that's one I'd certainly look at. If you look at that weather like, for instance, this weekend that, that's coming along, uh, they're forecasting quite big seas, but it's actually mostly a westerly wind. So you could also be quite surprised that we've actually got quite flat conditions and close this weekend because uh, they don't always, the algorithm isn't always correct when they talk about strong winds. They, they think it's going to be massive. It will be massive offshore, but it could still be quite calm and close. We're quite lucky in Sydney because we do have some um, protected areas inside harbours, et cetera, that we can spear as well. Obviously, keeping an eye on where the marine reserves are, et cetera, inside the harbour, because there are a couple of those. So once we've ascertained the conditions are diveable, um, then it, it's up to determining your types of, uh, of entries and exits. So if you're entering off a rocky platform, um, I always like to um, think about not just the entry, but also where you are going to exit from. Obviously, take into consideration weather conditions. If a southerly was to rock along um, when you're out there, often it means that where you entered isn't necessarily where you're going to be able to exit. So have an exit in mind, maybe two exits, one your primary and then one if things turn to shit, where you can exit, um, because it's, it's obviously very important um, to be able to um, exit safely and, and, and not um, get smashed up against the rocks. As far as entries go, I see all sorts of different techniques with people out there. Um, some of them work pretty well and some don't. Um, what I tend to do um, in reasonably calmish conditions is I wrap my float uh, and float rope around my spear gun and I turf that off the rocks and into the water. And then I enter um, using um, either a seated entry or, or, a, or a, just a, a diving into the water, holding my mask in place. You've got to be a little bit careful if you're doing a giant stride type entry, which scuba divers do, because often your fins will kick back on themselves and that can damage fins like carbon fins and crease them. So be aware of that. Also be aware when you're doing an enter of the sea conditions coming in over the rocks, because that can also damage your fins. And, and so it's all about timing. Um, what I tend to look for is the set coming in and the wave being at its peak, 
when I enter, and then the wave will pull you back off the rocks. I then retrieve my spear gun, undo it, and, and start my dive. As far as exits, like I said before, I tend to try to go in out the same place as I enter um, or have that plan beforehand. I might be exiting on a beach. Bear in mind that if you're exiting on a beach, there are laws around that. Um, so I try to always go as close as possible to the edge of the reef. And I always put my snorkel over the point of my spear gun whenever I'm on a reef just to, to, to show the, um, the, the bathers and everything that it's in a nice, safe situation and obviously have my spear gun unloaded. If I'm entering off a beach beside a rocky headland, pay a particular attention to rips because often um, rips will be right along that edge. If the rips pushing out, then that's great. It makes it nice and easy to, to um, get out um, through the waves, um, but be aware that you don't want to head back in against the rip. Um, same sort of things that you learn if you've ever done any surf lifesaving. Um, it's probably the what I tend to do uh, from a beach entry is once again have my um, float wrapped around my spear gun and I tend to time it so I, I work my way or walk my way out past the waves if I can and then put my fins on um, once I'm past the wave action depending on the size of the waves though. Um, as far as equipment goes um, from a safety perspective I have touched on this before, but it's absolutely essential um, that we dive with a float and flag. Um, there's a lot of people that are diving out there with a real setup. If you're diving with a real setup, that's fine, but make sure you have a float and flag and anchor that and dive around it. It's not safe anywhere, but certainly not safe in Sydney to be diving without a uh, float and flag. There's probably as many instances, I would say, with with boats crashing into divers as there are with shallow water blackout um, or um, with more so than even shark attacks. Probably the most dangerous shark out there is the propeller shark, I would say. Um, so be aware of that and don't just take for granted the fact that you've got a float and flag that the boats are going to um, keep their distance because often they don't, but at least it does give you some measure of safety. Um, as far as your gun goes, um, Hey, the, the spear gun is dangerous and has the potential to kill. Um, so you do need to be super careful with loading and unloading the spear gun. I did have an incident um, a number of years ago now, about four or five years ago, where I, I got out at Freshwater Pool. Um, um, and those of you on the Northern Beach would have dived that little um, gutter a few times to, to exit and, and enter. So I got out there and I looked down at the edge of the pool. So it's a public swimming pool and there's four spear guns lying along the rocks, all fully loaded. And the, the young um, teenagers were probably about 100 metres down the, the, the rock spur, they're just having a bit of a chin wag. They could have easily been picked up by any kid um, at the pool and, and fired and could have had all sorts of adverse um, problems. And um, I talk about um, putting our sport into a really negative position, something like that could, could occur and we could have all sorts of licensing issues. So we've got to be super aware of when we load the spear gun, obviously loading it in a, in a safe area away from pointing it towards any diver. And I always just unload the gun if I'm not having it directly in front of me and spearing it. So if I'm going after craze or anything like that, I unload the gun. There has been an instance in South Africa where a person was speared by his gun going off whilst it was moving backwards and, uh, and forwards and surge. So be super careful of that um, because um, obviously when you're going up to craze, you can't use the spear gun. So generally I just um, have a catch bag on my side and I just leave the gun in amongst the rocks but have that unloaded in that instance. Uh, Bjorn mentioned the dive watch. So um, this is one I'm wearing at the moment. There's heaps of different brands out there. This is one called the Atmos Mission. I actually really like it because it it has a vibration mode for your surface recovery. So you're sitting on the surface relaxing, you can set the surface recovery time. The standard is it will double your previous bottom time. So if you did a two minute um, bottom time, which is a long dive, um, it would be a four minute recovery time. And it would buzz telling you that it's safe um, from a recovery perspective to do another dive. Obviously, that does vary from individual to individual, but it is quite a conservative time. Four minutes is quite a long time on the surface. 
Um, so I would definitely invest in one of them. I do find it's peace of mind as well in that you'll often find in Sydney if there's dirty conditions um, and you're, you're diving in areas you're not familiar with, just being able to look at the, the depth that you did last time and give you a bit of an understanding of what you're normally comfortable in diving, I think it's important as well. Uh, the only other thing I've got written down from a safety perspective is, is just more around exposure protection. Um, obviously being warm enough to dive comfortably. Um, one of the things I find is if I'm diving cold, I very quickly reduce my bottom time and can no longer perform as, as well as if I'm warm and comfortable. So be aware of your exposure protection. If you're diving in say a three mil one piece um, suit at this time of the year, you're probably diving a little bit cold. And if you're shivering, then you should be investing in a thicker wetsuit. Obviously it's fine for me because I sell the things, but um, do keep that in mind. Uh, on to those um, sharks from a safety perspective. Um, the scientists out there are communicating that sharks are getting less and less. I can assure you that in um, New South Wales and probably the whole of, 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 of Australia, they seem to be on the increase. We're actually out there in the water and seeing them. Um, so sharks are becoming more common. Um, so I think with sharks, it is definitely an advantage to be diving in your buddy pair. Most of the time you'll have an experience with a shark after you've speared a fish, um, unless you're burling up in Queensland and places like that. So sharks are going to be coming in to a struggling fish and to have the protection of having another diver there is a great, uh, is a, is, is a great protection in its own right. Um, people are starting to invest in tourniquet kits, um, which you could leave on your boat. They are um, communicating that most people when they get attacked by a shark actually normally bleed out um, and that can be prevented by a tourniquet. So I noticed the last trip I went away with Bjorn up to, and, and Carmen up to the Great Barrier Reef that Bjorn had a tourniquet kit. In fact, I think there were three on board. So I think that's definitely worthwhile considering, but obviously with tourniquets, um, it's also having an understanding of how they work. Um, so if you're gonna invest in one, make sure you actually do a course on, on, on how they work. I haven't done one myself, so I'm, I'm not trying to pretend that I'm an expert with those, but um, they certainly do make a difference. Um, diving in currents is it certainly something that you need to be aware of as well. Um, I had an instance years ago up in the Great Barrier Reef, uh, which is quite concerning where I got caught in a current um, and stupidly let go of my float and really was very lucky that the boat picked me up and managed to get on board. But be aware of the currents. Um, if you're diving in Sydney and diving somewhere like Long Reef, which gets current from time to time, try to either um, uh, put, uh, dive forward of the current um, if you're all off the boat or dive with a boaty drifting along um, beside you with the current. It's always much better to do that from a safety perspective because um, when you're fighting a current, your oxygen levels are a lot higher and you know you can no longer dive your normal depth. So be aware of that if you're diving against the current. Uh, as far as boat diving goes, um, if you lose a diver, um, I would, if you're back on the boat and you can't find the diver, I wouldn't leave your anchor spot for some time. So just keep an eye out for them. Um, have some protocol around um, a spear gun being raised is a, is, a, is a good one and wave to be able to get attention. Uh, if you do decide to move the boat, make sure you take a GPS mark of the spot so you know exactly where your last location was. Um, and look, that's probably most of the, the things that we could talk about for, for a lot tonight on it, but I didn't want to carry on for, for too long. But I just wanted to reiterate um, with what Bjorn was saying around diving and buddy pairs. I think that is one of the, the, the major um, um, points as far as safety goes. Even in comp diving, I'm seeing in New Zealand now that they're starting to dive in pairs. And I really um, like that concept of one gun and diving in pairs. I think it does promote safety. I don't always do it myself, I must admit, but I think that it is common sense um, and it's great as a buddy pair if you can share in experiences and, um, and, um, and, and get fish together and get good results together. So it's one that I definitely recommend that you start working on as a team. Um, look, why don't we pass it um, open to any questions that you may have and, um, and um, we'll go from there. 
Yeah, awesome. Thanks so much for that, Neil. Um, all righty, do we have any questions out there? Maybe just pop a question in the chat so we can kind of have an order if there are a couple of people. While, while you're waiting for that, if, before any questions come through, if they come through, come and just jump in. But um, yes. I just want to touch a little bit on the educational side of things. Again, Bob mentioned this before, is at the end of the day, as Spiros, the more education we have, the better understanding of ourselves and the environment, the better it is. So a lot of people look towards buying whatever the latest and greatest equipment is. And of course, we're pro that because it's part of our company. But more importantly, getting yourself educated, whether that be an effective first aid course, so you do know how to use a tourniquet, for example, or anything else, but also um, effective spear fishing and freediving courses. And I can be a bit of a prude for this is making sure that when you are going to do one of these courses and they are worth doing, that the instructor has the run, runs on the board. Um, have a chat with the instructor, ask what their experience is like, where they've dived, how long they've been diving for, and to be honest, how they also got their certification. Um, we have now more than ever, we have more freediving and spearing instructors in Australia than we ever have, which is fantastic. But it also means we have more excellent ones and more not so excellent ones out there. So for your money, make sure you get somebody that really knows what they're talking about and has, I guess you'd say, earned their stripes. Um, and there are plenty of great ones out there all over the country. So there's definitely plenty of opportunity and there's no question you'll be a better diver, a safer diver, and you'll be more productive spearfishing after doing that training. So it's, it's a win-win for everybody. Anyway, sorry, I'm just thought about that. That's a really great piece of advice and it's really, really important. Um... I think, do anybody, any more questions? Comments, statements? No? I think we're about good. There we go. I think you guys have been a bit too thorough and answered everything. So that is amazing. Oh, um, Harvey, recommend a free diving spearfishing course in the Sydney region. Well, that's us, Harvey. <laughs> we, <laughs> uh, Fabio, who's sitting over there, is our spearing instructor who you can see if he gives you a wave and we also have freediving courses with Adam Stern running. So um, yeah, very welcome to come and do a course with us. Otherwise there are a lot of other great people around. Um, freediving family we recommend to who is Adam Stern's company as well on the Central Coast. All righty. Um, <laughs> awesome, are there any can more- we mention clubs? Can, we, can we mention clubs as an alternative? Absolutely, 100%. So, uh, so who, who, sorry. Yeah, so like with the clubs, um, you're not going to be, there's, you shouldn't have the time limits. So you're not pressurised with that time limits and that constraint. And it's a continual lifelong progression. So long as, you know, you, you're within the club and you participate in the club. And, you know, clubs are interesting, obviously, because the more you contribute, obviously, the more you're going to get out of them. And within the club, you know, when people actually see you participate and you turn up and do that, you will actually be, you'll be shown more spots and shown more. So it's, you can't really turn up to a club and say, yeah, here I am, uh, show me the crown jewels. I want to know all the, the, the Jewfish spots from here to the Central Coast. But um, mm -hmm. after a while, you know, if when, when the way I, I explain it to people is when you're ready to learn the story, then you're ready to learn the spots. So when the history of a particular spot and, you know, how it was passed on through the club, the song line, so to speak. So when you're ready to learn the song and the story and the history, a little bit of fun about it all, that's when I think you're ready to be shown, you know, where, the, where this is the Jewfish hole that was found by such and such and showed such and such. And they shot, you know, five here one day in 1967. And then, you know, a, you know, a couple more and this time and this time, and it was shown to me, blah, blah, blah. And I've got this many. These spots do exist. You know, I've been watching a little school in Mulloway of Sydney for the last three or four months. Um, and so they're still there. Um, so these are the sorts of stuff that you get with club. Now, along with that, when you're participating within a club, you will have people that will see what level that your skills are at and they will tailor your, your next trip without you even learning. So um, like, for example, I like to target particular species, you know, a, a good one to start uh, entry level spiros on I find is a red rock cod because when you're finding red rock cod you're diving properly and you're diving in the right spots 
Um, so, but yeah, I'm just throwing a, you know, a, a bit out there to join a spearfishing club and participate in it. And it's a really safe and fun way to improve and you'll make some lifelong friends too. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree, Bob. I mean, we've got, obviously, we've got two major groups worth of clubs in Australia, whether it be USFA, which is very strong in your region, and AUF in mine. And um, in both cases, they offer a huge amount of support, and most regions have their local clubs, so that's the local knowledge as well. Um, I know Neil and I are both members as well, and on top of the benefit of being in a club as well there's also insurance and stuff that's available which without the club affiliation would be much harder to get a hold of so there's lots of benefits being involved there's no doubt about that a hundred percent i think that um also bob like when it comes to um because obviously i'm a member of um north shore underwater club who have been absolutely amazing and what we tend to do is we will recommend north shore obviously being for our region you know a uh, a great club geographically to join as well um, but what we often do is we say you know start by getting your basic training down you know understand the basics of free diving understand the basics of spearing or if they're feeling comfortable already by the time we meet them we'll often send them to clubs to actually um, to do exactly that to join up to meet people and to um, to get involved because exactly like you said they get lifelong friends plus the, the sessions themselves are like just going to club meetings is in like it's just the guys are just full of knowledge. It's amazing. I learn something every time. I'm there there, so there the seems to be a, a little bit of hesitancy, it's but um, th there shouldn't be hesitant if you are considering going to club. Particularly, I'm I'm an old yeah. North Shore underwater pub boy, and I've been there yeah. for decades. But I, at the yeah. moment, I did I I resigned in a nice way, not not in a nasty way, because I'm involved with uh, the new Asian club. So you know, uh, to, yeah. to help establish that, and because you know, if you want to see positive changes you have to be part of that change um so i've taken a temporary break from north shore um yeah. to be part of the orcas but of yeah. course north shore is still my original and home club and yeah i would absolutely recommend to everybody in the northern beaches to attend the club meetings um, they're great people um yeah it's good fun yeah. and your learning curve yeah. will be steep if you get involved with them Thank I'm a member of the USFA, Bob, and I'm mostly yep. a member because I want you to share your flathead spots with me. Jasper's calling to see They're everywhere at the moment. <laughs> They're everywhere at the moment, Neil. I, I wasn't even looking for them yesterday and I picked up two more. Like, good. Good. I can't get, like, I go to the most obscure places. This year's been amazing. There's flathead everywhere. That's good. Well, I'll have to uh, get out uh, and get amongst them. Carmen. Do you happen to have the, oh, I guess we'll just Google USFA or AUF to find out where their local club is, wouldn't they? Gentlemen? Yeah, and look, yeah, we, also, we also have a safety guidebook. So like all the stuff that you guys, you guys have done an excellent, yeah, thank you. You've done a really great job tonight. And um, there's also, if people do want another resource, USFA have a safety handbook. And, you know, that's become a worldwide, we've got to thank the Department of Fisheries. They funded us to do that. And now I think it's one of the most searched safety and spearfishing information booklets in the English speaking world. You know, like uh, I see people in the States and through the UK and Pacific Islands uh, going to the USFA uh, safety handbook and guide as a reference source. So that's, a, you can download that, it's free. Um, and there's also some good information there too. I've still got I've still got a few of the DVDs in the garage. Unfortunately, the old DVDs um, lost their place in the world. But um, yeah, that's a bloody good resource. Um, awesome. So I think Simon, you guys were all involved in it. But yeah, I think that that's excellent. Um, and it, it's it's hard to get come by those booklets, though, Bob. Uh, well, we okay. So what happened was because of COVID last year, um, we actually digitised it instead of doing a book because we just weren't going to be able because we were actually going to. Uh, Hit you up, mate, on some of your travels to try and disperse them for us, if you remember. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, we, yeah, but sure. we did because of COVID, we didn't. So we just made it fully digital. It meant we had to sort of redo a few bits and pieces and change stuff. But it's now interactive too. So if you say go onto a fisheries link, you can push like a little fish icon and bang, it'll it'll just take you directly to fisheries. And the same with maritime stuff and things like that. So. It's downloadable and it will be the USFA safety guide. And I'm sure you'll be able to do it in a search. I'm sure some smart person may be able to put that up as a link. But um, yeah, it mustn't be too hard to find because tens of thousands of people are looking at it weekly. 
Very good. Yeah, we'll definitely have a look at that. Well, look, thank you so much, Bob, for your input. And um, well, I'm going to have to uh, start to wrap that one up because we're hitting 8.30. But um, Neil, Bjorn, thank you so much. That was such an interesting, um, such an interesting webinar. And I think that everybody got a lot out of that. It's just, even though if you know these things, just being able to reiterate them and really kind of concrete them back into the forefront when we are um, out spearing, I think is really, really important. So um, thank you so, so much for joining us tonight. And um, everyone, I will put some of those links up on our social pages over the next couple of days. Um, thank you again. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Now, before you guys go, as, um, as Bjorn mentioned, we are going to dive deeper next week, pardon the pun, um, into uh, looking at blackouts. So we actually have Adam Stern, who is eight times um, Australian record holder and, uh, you know, YouTube, um, yeah, Sensation. master of YouTube joining us um, next week to talk a bit more about blackouts. So um, thankfully, Bjorn and Neil are amazing at really honing and spearfishing, and we're going to go further into, into the free diving side of it next week. Same time. Um, Thursday 7.30, you'll see the event pop up tomorrow on our Facebook, um, but be sure to register for that one when it pops up and, um, and we'll definitely examine this topic a lot more. Um, Neil, Bjorn, thank you so, so, so much. Really, really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we look forward to seeing you again soon.